textbooks, dermatology, primary care. Throughout our lives, we will all interact with the healthcare system. So, what happens when that system is not designed with certain groups of people in mind? As a black person in America, I have experienced firsthand racial disparities in healthcare. The turning point for me came during the pandemic when at a local clinic, I was asked if I had a red rash on my skin. At that point, it dawned on me that some healthcare professionals did not realize that skin rashes do not exhibit the same way on different skin pigmentations. If something so obvious could be so casually overlooked by a healthcare professional, what other elements of care, treatment, research, and education are also being ignored, and what does it mean for people of color using this healthcare system? I am Vivian Kopsinger Birchall, and in this series, we will take a closer look at disparities in healthcare, speaking with medical professionals, and hearing personal stories to get a better understanding of those disparities and explore ideas and strategies for how to bridge the gaps. Excellency Carlos de Santos, the ambassador of Mozambique to the United States. In the middle of the panel, we have Her Excellency Elsie Kanza of Tanzania, uh, the ambassador to the USA. Our fourth panelist, we have Dr. Satis Gopal, who's director of the Center for Global Health at the National Cancer Institute. And our final panelist is Dr. Uh, Will. Yeah. <laughs> Lose my voice. So our final panelist is Dr. Will Legrand from here at Johns Hopkins. Now we've heard this morning a number of aspects around the commission um, described, and those the, the commission report led to eight actions, which I'll just reiterate here. Action one was precision cancer control planning. Action two involving data in, and improving data acquisition and cancer registration. Action three, designing healthcare systems that promote equity of access. Action four, increasing cure and improving care. Action five, effective palliation. Action six, building and maintaining the workforce. Action seven, innovation and research. And finally, action eight, investing in telehealth. Now what I think would be good for us to hear today is some comments from each of our panelists around the report, the endeavor that's taking place. We had a large number of commissioners from many countries across Africa involved in this quite seminal piece of work. And I'd like to hear everyone's perspectives on the report, these action plans, and how we can implement. The key thing is implementation at this point. So perhaps I'll start at this end of the panel and work through. So, Professor Adai. So thank you so much for having me. And I must say that uh, the commission has done a very good job is the first of its kind, and we must um, thank Lancet Commission for helping us to come out with the problems and the solutions. We know of several problems, but the way to go about it and how to solve the problems, it's very important. Um, I don't think we should 
wait until we have all the points, the, the call to action points, before we can do something. We have to start concurrently. concurrently. So if it's a prevention, we need to look at the things that we can do. Tobacco control. It was those, in those days that we thought Africans were not using tobacco. Now, Africans are smoking and using shisha a lot. And so, and shisha is cigarette. So these are things we need to talk about. Lack of exercise, our diet, our diet has changed. And so we are getting a lot of obese women. And why are we surprised when breast cancer is now occupying the, the number one position? And so we should look at Africa as um, a group of countries in diversity. We don't have one uh, group of things in the whole of Africa. So if, for example, in West Africa, we have breast cancer as a priority, in Southern Africa, it's cervical cancer. So these are the things we need to look at from the, the commission's book and then see how we can implement and get our policy makers to come on board. Cancer is almost a pandemic now. And so we cannot sit and assume that nothing is happening. Our people are dying. They are dying too early, needlessly, prematurely. What can we do? Let's create awareness on a larger scale to change the narrative of the people, to change the mentality of our people. That once we don't know the theology of something, it means a spiritual. And let people understand that they have to go to the hospital. And where are the hospitals? Accessibility is an issue. And also, even when you've gone closer to the people, you've gone to educate and clinically examine the person, you found a problem, the, the person has no money for treatment. And we don't have any social support systems. And so the problems are multi-faceted, uh, but we can look out for people, champions, in each country, bring them together, make sure that we are putting the, um, the outcomes we found in the report to good use and not let it sleep. We shouldn't put the book to sleep. We should rather um, go all out and put the book to good use for the benefit of our own people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dye. Mary Nolte, Presidency, Carlos de Santos, Mozambique, the Ambassador for Mozambique, and your reflections, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, the solution to any global problem uh, starts from identifying uh, the problem itself and uh, seeking solutions for it. And the best way of going about uh, identifying and also finding solutions is to bring those experts that know the area well and can speak to, to the issue, can debate with others in the field uh, and then present uh, the result. Uh, what in academia call, uh, they call evidence or empirical evidence. Uh, this report is, for me, an important instrument in that regard. It has used the wealth of knowledge, global wealth of knowledge, on cancer. And uh, it raises the profile of the issue, which is global, and it requires a global solution. Uh, I want to agree with the professor when she says that we have to make sure that that report reaches all the decision makers, the policy makers, all academ uh, academics uh, everywhere in, in the world. Uh, and maybe we can leapfrog some stages of developing solutions, even in a continent with challenges that we all know 
um, in Africa. I think uh, debates like this that we are having in this conference should be multiplied uh, with the African Union, with the regional economic communities, uh, with countries themselves, and uh, try to look uh, in each country from the uh, calls of action, what are we missing? And uh, what is specific to that country? What should be first, second, because, as it has been said at the conference, it's, uh, there's no uh, one size fits all. We have specificities. So uh, if we have these debates, this dialogue uh, within countries, within regions, and within the continent of Africa, uh, just maybe we can do justice to this report by uh, acting on the actions that are being proposed there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now turning to Her Excellency Elsie Kanza, the Ambassador for Tanzania to the USA. Your thoughts, please. One of the most uh, um, critical aspects uh, after hearing about the report and, and hearing various speakers is it's, the report is incredibly insightful. It's, it's very rich um, from a policy making point of view. You're able to go in depth in all the key areas that have been highlighted um, as uh, priorities in, in the action plan. Uh, so that is helpful because when you are scanning the landscape, um, you need a map to help you figure out what the different pathways are and to have some idea of what you need to focus your attention on. Uh, resources are limited and so it's always helpful to have a framework that allows you to assess um, where you may need to place emphasis and then also to have a sense of the, the depth of, of the challenge and therefore be able to determine what trade-offs need to be made. So, so that uh, was something I found useful and know will be very useful uh, for my colleagues in, in government and that brings me to a second uh, point that I'd like to, to emphasize, which is about communicating the report. The report is great once it's, uh, it's been produced, but as you're doing during the summit, it's important to share it, and not just share it with the experts, uh, but share it with the non-experts, right? So it's not just sufficient to get policymakers on board, uh, but we need to get our parliamentarians on board. We need to get our societies on board. I was speaking to a colleague earlier and saying all of us know at least one or two or three people uh, suffering from cancer or recently passed away from cancer. Uh, but what this report helps uh, draw attention to is, is the impact. And that has uh, really been a wake up call for me personally, uh, because when you're able to see the magnitude of the challenge, you realize that this is not just an individual issue that we're dealing with on a family level or um, in amongst our friends, right, a sort of community, it's actually a, it's, it's a global challenge. It's a, and it's a national crisis, as, so to speak, if we're not able to head it off and slow down, uh, slow the tide. Um, so that's a concern that needs to be shared by everyone. So a shared concern allows us collectively um, to think through what, it, what the implications are for our countries, for our communities, and then uh, be able to reach consensus about how to address it. Tanzania is very much a consensus-driven uh, country when it comes to making decisions, so it's very important to get everyone on the same page. So thinking about how, you know, leveraging different channels also for communication, part of it may just be dialogue and, and conferences, others may be um, leveraging new technology, what can you do with social media, for instance, are able to reach um, everyone. In, in different ways, just so that they, everyone appreciates um, what this challenge is and starts to think about uh, what they can do about it. And as was pointed out, some cancers are preventable um, and therefore nobody should take uh, a detection of cancer as a death sentence. And, and I think that is not fully appreciated by many people because they don't have the means to address the, the situation. Um, the last aspect that, uh, that comes through, uh, not just from the report, but then also from, from this gathering, is the importance of collaboration um, and how we can strengthen uh, collaboration, again, at a global level, right? Um, I'm particularly concerned about how we can um, sort of deep dive in, in our countries and take that collaboration right to the village level. Um, it should not just stay in cities and urban areas and with uh, 
decision makers, it, it should affect everyone. And so how can we um, create platforms or spaces for different segments of society to collaborate um, at a global level, right? Um, that will be helpful also because with increased research and with increased innovation, new solutions come up, um, new, there's new information. Um, unfortunately, there's also a lot of fake information out there, so it's important to have spaces where everyone is able to get the latest, uh, most up-to-date, accurate uh, picture about what tools are available, um, what new standards of care are available, as well as you know, building on people's experiences about how they can be able to weather um, this challenge in, in different respects, whether as a, a can somebody with cancer or with uh, people who are supporting those who have cancer. Thank you very much. And Dr. Thoughts. Thanks so much, David. As you alluded to, um, I work at the National Cancer Institute in the United States, which um, happens to be the largest supporter of cancer research in the world. Um, this includes a large international portfolio, um, including substantial investments in sub-Saharan Africa. And we are always seeking to try to maximize the impact of the science that we support so that it has the greatest effect on actual people's lives. Um, so it's very valuable for us to have a group of international experts, uh, including, um, as was noted this morning, more than half of them being from sub-Saharan Africa, um, more than half of them being women, to come up with consensus, such a clear and comprehensive document that outlines what the priority should be and makes recommendations about what specific actions are we often actually solicit such reports from the external community to help advise, to help guide our research programs. And so in some ways, this is a free unsolicited <laughs> report that we've received from, I think, a remarkable group of experts uh, working across sub-Saharan Africa. And I think um, what is clear is that we can, there's a continued need, I think, for high impact research to, that is informed by many of the um, themes that were raised in this report and that I think will inform many of the actions that were um, articulated in the report. And I think um, one of the things that we will continue to think about at the NCI is um, you know, how we can um, uh, support the kind of science that will really um, help with the um, implementation of some of the findings. So it's very helpful to us internally. The other comment I would make is that it's also very helpful to raise visibility for this issue externally, so the C in NCI stands for cancer. So we think about cancer all day, every day. But that's not true for many um, non-governmental and governmental partners that are also critical partners um, for many of, for really achieving step change on a large scale across the continent. And so I think the continued advocacy, the continued engagement of leaders from the public and private sectors, both within Africa as well as um, internationally, even other U.S. government agencies that don't have a singular focus on cancer in the way that the NCI does, um, that's very helpful to us as we make um, advocate for many of these same priorities and issues internally within the U.S. government. Thank you very much. And finally, Professor Ingram. Yeah, so I really want to say that, you know, uh, first of all, this commission, there are a couple of things that I would like to really come out with. One of the things, the cancer moonshot, which is really good, that we had, um, um, you know, the part your participation, you know, and Dr. Carter and Leon participate from the White House. I think really having a conversation about um, collaborations, because I really think global health is local health. It's easy to see that for um, COVID-19, where if a strain develops in South Africa, it comes to the United States and vice versa. For cancer, it's a little bit more difficult because it's not communicable. Um, but we really need to make that argument that there is a connection. You talked about you know, the technologies that are being developed in Mozambique, uh, mm -hmm. the ambassador from Mozambique. So, such low-cost technologies that have been developed and the funding from NCS and for Global Health that you are prioritizing um, now, those technologies can also benefit disparities here in the United we see that this, I mean, one of the American uh, Association for Cancer Research showed that, you know, African Americans die, you know, from prostate cancer three times, right? 
breast cancer, what you're talking about in Ghana. Same things are happening here. So some of the interventions, innovations, and the research that's been developed can really benefit the United States and vice versa. And I think that <clears throat> as we think about the cancer moonshot's goal to have cancer deaths you know, uh, to 50% in 25 years, in Africa, we need to do the same, right? We need to set that same goal. And I think that by collaborating, we can both accelerate. In Africa, we say, you know, you can go fast by yourself, but you can go further together. Uh, and I think that by collaborating, you know, United States could probably just work by themselves and, you know, but if you really want to go further and have the incidence rate and go further, you know, international collaborations becomes even more important. Uh, there's a lot of unleashed power, you know, when you travel to Africa, you know, uh, you live there so you kind of know, and all of, all of us have, you know, have that experience, you know, engaging internationally and having this power unleashed to kind of accelerate this. Uh, it's really one of the things that I think from the Commission report uh, we really want to push. Uh, second thing to that is the diaspora. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, the ambassadors are represented the diaspora. The African Union ambassador left, but uh, you know, she mentioned that in her points. And I think that that's something that we need to reignite as well as we did from the cancer Monsha. Uh, it may be challenging. When I was in Ghana, and then this last point I will make, I talked to the former president, Kufo, and I was asking, why is it that we don't have a solution that can really, you know, bring people together across Africa um, to do more, you know, on this. And he raised basically the same issue that, you know, each country that you mentioned uh, has its own priorities. Um, and sometimes getting everybody together around the priorities, you know, and giving up some power. Because if you come and say, okay, let's focus on breast cancer in Ghana, um, you know, somebody in South Africa who is Southern Africa who is interested in cervical cancer will say, but why are you doing that? Um, we actually saw that with the African Union ambassador recently, uh, the last one, uh, where you know they're trying to build Wakanda, and they're talking about doing that in Zambia, and then some diaspora people started saying, okay, why in Zambia? Why not build it in Ethiopia? Why not build it in Senegal? Right. So finding that having that conversation about finding things that are cross-cutting, so we don't have to compete like that. And there are some things that we can do that from the Lancet Commission, setting up things like telehealth infrastructure. Facebook tried to do some of those things recently. You know, if you actually invest in some of that infrastructure, it can help. It's something that every country can benefit. If we can all agree that if you invest into that, it will help whether breast cancer or cervical cancer. We see the technology is coming up because we're empowering people like that. So for me, the two things really is, you know, um, you know that collaboration really emphasizing the fact that global health is local health. And hopefully really like uh, Dr. Young mentioned, what can we use at each? I think you know you, you are you are African now, so uh, <laughs> um, you know. So we really have to kind of engage that U.S. Africa collaborations with the help of the ambassadors um, and, uh, and, and 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 then get the diaspora relaxed to be involved. When you were working on the on the report, did anything surprise you at all? Even though there is a lot of knowledge that you already have about the incidence of cancer on the continent, but did you find anything, you know, many surprising? Yeah, a couple of things were surprising to me. Uh, one was the lessons from the COVID-19 actually exposed some things that I think there are lessons that we can learn from COVID-19 to address the issue of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, let me say telehealth. So we started looking into what is happening uh, you know, digitally in Africa, because the barriers of COVID kind of stopped, you know. And we saw that, you know, the, the, the penetration, you know, people are using a lot of that telehealth. The infrastructure was set up even for COVID-19 that we can now leverage for this cancer. I knew there was some of that, and we've been pushing that before, but it was, even the Lancet Digital Science, there's a lot of publications showing what test cases of what's happening in these lower mid income countries. And I think that, you know, that's something that we can really, uh, it's an access issue. Uh, talking about the United States, you know, you can face the same thing in resource poor settings here, uh, where, you know, people don't, you saw that during the COVID-19, African-Americans, uh, poor communities did not have access to, you know, even though you had telehealth, they don't have computers and they have those things. So um, making sure that those things, investing in that here in the United States, but also investing that in Africa. So I think that that was one of the things that really surprised me, how much Africa is expanding on telehealth, uh, on technology, let me say, information and communication technologies, and the opportunity that's there that we can really leverage 
coming out of COVID-19. Uh, the other thing was, you know, I actually knew it, but I was, it was very difficult was uh, to get that again, is, the, is the, fight, the use of traditional medicine and phytomedicine, how that can hamper, um, you know, access to conventional health. One of the pictures I showed earlier on of the breast cancer from, um, from Beatrice, you know, really shows the, you know, I was really shocked. I knew that this was there, but you see that 76 to 90 percent of women, people who are diagnosed with cancer, die. I mean, looking at kids, kids, we actually knew some more that, right? In the United States, if five people get, children get diagnosed with cancer, you know, four, about four of those get treated, you know, they survive. In Africa, it's the reverse. You know, if you have five kids, four die. You know, and so, um, you know, some of the, that's what, uh, you know, Ambassador Kanza was mentioned. I mean, some of these statistics coming out of this report really make it more compelling, you know, to see how, you know, really mobilize action there. But the traditional health thing, you know, and complementary health was a barrier. You know, we, we see that. So what we really recommend here, you see the picture, is that we need to engage the traditional healers more. Early on in the pipeline, you really need to see them as part of the healthcare system. That was a very powerful thing coming out of this commission that we need to really invest into. Vivian Virtual here. Um, my question is, as somebody who worked on African Union projects before, specifically the APRM and NEPAR, I understand the complexities of uh, coming, you know, the African nations and uh, coming together either to uh, be to support projects or a seed to certain uh, uh, instruments. Uh, so, what is your vision? Uh, I'm now looking at the ambassadors. <laughs> what are you, what's your vision for getting the AU actually behind healthcare, specifically this Global Health Catalyst Summit, so that you know they, they can show commitment to saving? <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I've had the fortune of um, representing the African Union in my previous role uh, for many years and, and working with governments in sub Saharan Africa. And one thing that I can say for sure is that there's a whole, there's a misperception in the public about um, our regional organizations. They do not fully, the general public does not fully appreciate uh, the institutions and how the institutions function, but more importantly, see the value, and which is why you tend to see a lot of criticisms um, in the general public um, about these organizations. Mm -hmm. um, within the governments, we, there's a much stronger appreciation for the role of the, that these institutions play and hence you have a commitment, to be it uh, amongst ministers for agriculture, for the agricultural agenda, um, as you had earlier, uh, between health ministers, because there are some diseases that don't know borders, right? Mosquitoes don't respect borders, for instance. So if I solve malaria in my corner and you don't sort it out in yours, it's problematic. Um, I may not have the means as your neighbor to be able to help you, but perhaps by sitting together with other colleagues, uh, were able to find others who are able to provide assistance and or just raise awareness and you much you much uh, you have a stronger ability to do so as a block for instance where you have uh, health issues that are global when you're able to raise awareness and visibility as a block of countries and not just a single country um, that is seeing the devastating effects in that individual country so a key challenge, though, that we need to address is how to help our, our general populations um, see the value. And part of, this, you know, part of this challenge lies with the AU, uh, but then also with governments to be able to help uh, the populations appreciate why global concerns should also be local concerns. Because remember, uh, our members of parliament are elected. So as far as the, the population is concerned, the, right, the elected officials are accountable to them. Um, and so they do not see why they should care. This is a generalization, but why should you care about something that's happening on a different continent, whereas you have something that is affecting you today? We still have people dying from cholera, for instance. So it becomes much harder to see why they, they should um, support uh, decisions or policies that are made that are really thinking about tomorrow rather, rather than today. 
Um, so there's a two-way street in terms of raising uh, awareness about um, these regional organizations, and then the second is strengthening the instruments, so that, such that even when decisions are taken, uh, reports are, are produced, uh, like the one that uh, is being launched today, uh, that there's thought given to the implementation. Right? What will the implementation mechanism be? and what kind of support can be mobilized. It may be, as was pointed out earlier, um, proven technologies that are, are affordable, uh, within reach, that have, uh, been, have proven themselves in the African context, not just outside of, of, of Africa, and being able to share those, um, and working out uh, the infrastructure for that. Uh, and here it's not just the physical one, for instance, with access to um, internet technology, but it's also with human skills and, and how we can build those capabilities. Um, so personally, I feel that if our people are empowered and see the value of how these organizations uh, can help them in, in their daily lives, that in itself also empowers these institutions to do more for the African population. Thank you so much. In fact, we have realized that the religious beliefs are sometimes uh, preventing people from going to the hospitals for treatment. And people can stay in a prayer camp with stage one disease until stage four. And so we need to tackle that. And during the launch in Ghana, we had a religious person, Professor Frim Paul Manson, who, you know, came to say that he sees the pastors who are keeping the patients as murderers. And that is what they are, who they are. People do not want to touch them because, you know, you don't touch my anointed. So nobody wants to talk about that. But that is the reality. And the earlier we, we spoke about it, the better it will be for all of us. We can't stop people from believing. So they believe in whatever they, they want to believe in. But we should also educate them that let your pastor pray for you and you go to the hospital. I wanted to touch on the research that is ongoing here and what we can benefit from. Professor Ingwa is a living example of brain gain. It used to be brain drain, but we should focus on the brain gain. And so we need to have centers of excellence in our countries whereby we will be uh, managing cancers holistically. We deal with uh, preventive measures, um, we deal with diagnostics, treatment, palliative care, research, research, research. Because what is happening here may not necessarily be uh, what will be happening in Ghana. We do have a lot of triple negative disease. The black Americans also do have but it's because we have the same roots. But has it changed with time? Because they've moved and a lot of things are going on. You know, they are not the, the original African genes. So probably we should look at our setting. And we can only look at it when we do the research that is happening here, which he is involved. So. We have, if we have such centers, we collaborate with Harvard, John Hopkins, and we have NCI who has been doing a lot of research with us, and the other agencies 
who are not necessarily in cancer. I'm happy my NCI boss mentioned that because USAID is there, other agencies are there, they can also come into the cancer sphere and see what we can do collectively. Again, politically, the landscape in sub-Saharan Africa is not good. Our governments keep changing every four years, every five years, sometimes even before their term, they are, they are changed. And so what can we do to have a stable platform or system to handle the cancers? And that's where I look at the African Union. If the AU would come out and bring governments together and you know, give out policies which should not change because the government changed, but sustainable policies, I think when we put pressure, our government will start you know, seeing cancers as part of them because they are also involved, but it's up to us to do the necessary advocacy, to let them understand that we are fighting for our own people. So please get involved and look for the resources. It's easier for AU to find resources to help bring Dr. Professor Ngwa's um, invention to Ghana, for example, than an individual person doing it. And so let us tap into their brains and use that to develop uh, Africa and fight the cancers which are staring in our faces on a daily basis. engaging the diaspora, you know, we have that Genesis 2016, but what does that really mean? Because we have heard this for years now, you know, acknowledging the diaspora as a six, but what does it mean, especially with healthcare? There's been, you know, a project like this one, uh, the Global Health Palace, uh, Dr. Tangwa and his team have done an incredible job reaching out to the African But what does it mean to the African countries? Are they reaching out? Are they laying out these particular landscapes for the diaspora to actually engage? And what can be done for governments like the ones you represent here today to for them to open up the, their arms to Africa to diaspora innovation and also actually take actively fund some of these problems? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, no, indeed, we were talking at the conference about the importance of the diaspora and uh, the challenge that we speak about has to do with the diaspora, the diaspora being organized itself for us ambassadors and embassies to be able to have uh, interlocutors because you cannot speak to an individual uh, member of the diaspora. Uh, but that being said, it is a matter of uh, a challenge for the diaspora and us to work together to find the best way. So what we should be doing is, in even in smaller settings, start speaking about how do we organize this better. Because political will is already there. A decision has been taken by the African heads of state and government, and uh, there is a will from diaspora. Uh, but when we do service, for instance, just to know how many Mozambicans are here, we are doing that right now. Uh, we call that uh, diaspora mapping. We a very simple survey. They are not responding. The only way we get information about Mozambicans and we have a database on is when they need documents, passport, IDs. They have to come to the embassy uh, so that we can collect, the, uh, collect data. So we ask them to register. We have a consular registry. But that, we know, represents only a small fraction of the people who are here. 
So it's a matter of us getting better at uh, organizing our interactions with the diaspora and the diaspora itself organizing itself better. Maybe, uh, just uh, uh, to take the example of Dr. Mwa and, uh, and the team, they can help us because they are organized, of course. They can help us and even with suggestions of how we can do this, let's say, state by state in the 50 states of the United States. Uh, can we identify one serious individual who can then become part of a whole that uh, we have uh, sessions at the African Union mission here or at any other African embassy, just to look at the mechanics of doing it. Because there's no lack of political will, there's no lack of will from the community, so it's really about the mechanics of doing it. Throw parties with food, will come. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. If, if I may just build on that, uh, because I have uh, had an, an additional perspective that um, I challenge the diaspora to take into account as well. Uh, this is from more seasoned uh, diplomats. <laughs> I, I'm fresh <laughs> in America. And the concern is, and this is the elephant in the room, right? In many cases, you have diaspora who are critics of their government. Now, it's very difficult to partner with your critic. That's a reality. And so to the extent that we can create spaces and platforms that are depoliticized, where you take into account national interests, continental interests, right, rather than political interests, I think we will see more progress. So perhaps this gathering here around cancer and find the cancer experts, you know, holistically in terms of the health system or health in, in general and facilitate these platforms where they can come together, share their experiences. We're going to see a lot more progress in terms of the impact and the, posi the positive impact and um, more welcome engagement, uh, including investments uh, by governments, which you, which you raised, will be much more forthcoming. Um, then if, uh, if you're working with detractors. I mean, with detractors, it's the simply, it's impossible to make progress because you're essentially not in agreement. Um, so that's a challenge I also pose to the diaspora and say, really, what is it that you want to achieve? If it is development, then let's create the right platforms for that. If it is political, please, right? The political process is very clear, right? You run for office, you get elected, you go into office. Yeah, thanks, David. That's a great question. Uh, um, as I often think on a daily basis, one, I miss living and working in Sub-Saharan Africa. Two, I think even though it's very different now being at the NCI, I, I do think that these periods in my life are very closely linked. I often joke that I perhaps went from the place with the least cancer-specific resources in the world to the place with the most cancer-specific resources in the world. I, I guess a couple of things that I was struck by is one, Research and data are really important. Um, I think this was, and doing research where the benefits are felt to be accrued by the people participating, I think we often haven't done a terrific job of that for um, you know, underserved communities even in the United States, let alone, I mean, they often have participated in research and haven't seen the benefits return to them. But I think when you try to build a research portfolio and programming where patients and communities see benefits being returned to them, I think they're very eager, in my experience, to participate. Um, so it's not so much, uh, you know, uh, you know that um, people sometimes say in the US, they don't trust us, but the question is, have we been trustworthy and have we behaved in a way that has um, accrued that trust? You know, trust really has to be earned on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, decades long basis, and I think that is possible, but it requires the sustained effort. Um, and I, I think, again, patients have been very eager to participate in research studies, including 
for example, things that have historically been quite sensitive in Malawi or in Africa in general, like human tumor sequencing, et cetera. We have not experienced a lot of pushback for those kinds of efforts because patients felt like they were benefiting. And I think they ultimately want to create knowledge that they feel benefits their compatriots and the next you know, patients who will come with that, with that same cancer. So I think that was very striking and I think informs much of what we're thinking about currently at the NCI. Um, the other thing that I was always impressed by is how much talent there is. Um, and I heard this often from deans of medical schools um, that you know, they would tell me frequently, our, um, you know, our young people never thought of studying cancer. This seemed like a hopeless thing where you could never have a career. Um, but I think there's such an upswell of young talent that really wants to develop clini you know, clinical research careers. It, it's frustrating when you're really smart and have a lifetime ahead of you and a career ahead of you to be faced with the same questions day after day that you don't have the ability to answer. And I think that's, that's that bed, bench to bedside cycle, virtuous cycle that we often talk about in the US where you can see a patient in the course of a clinic day have a number of questions raised that you then have the ability to answer in a meaningful way and then return those results back to the patients. That's incredibly rewarding for researchers, physicians, patients alike. And I think creating those opportunities in country, centering a lot of our scientific energy in Malawi rather than in the United States and allowing young people the opportunity to participate, it, it just unlocked you know, all of these terrifically talented young people who see themselves as wanting to develop careers addressing this incredibly important public health problem. And I think um, we talk a lot about infrastructure and I think we mean Linux and CT scanners, and um, but I, I think honestly, Africa's best resource, in my opinion, is its young people. And I think if we can find the right ways to support them, I honestly think a lot of these larger than life issues that we struggle with, they will figure these things out. Um, we just have to create an environment that allows them to do that in a way that, um, you know, is sustaining. I think it's a very important question. Um, so there are elements of what you asked that we have we don't deal with at the NCI. So right. we don't issue patents, for example. Right, right, right. Um, we support research that leads to patents, um, both in the private and the public sector and, the, and in academia, but we don't formally issue patents. That's not our role. Right. Um, we are having, I would say, major conversations across the NIH and the NCI related to, I think, some of the equity issues that you raised. Um, I think we're very aware that um, communities often haven't accrued benefits from research that they've participated in, that the research enterprise hasn't been inclusive enough, um, and that includes both at the individual subject level as well as at the investigator level. Um, and so we're having a lot of conversations now, how do we um, uh, evolve cancer health disparities research so it is not only descriptive but can start to address some of the inequities that we have been recurrently describing in certain communities. How can we diversify the scientific enterprise to bring underrepresented groups that have historically not had high levels of success competing for NCI funding into the fold? We know that that will strengthen the scientific enterprise, um, and, that, and, that, and we're having a lot of conversations about how to do that. I would say both at the NCI and NIH level, I think um, this is really an unprecedented moment in time. There have been efforts around this 
always, but I think the level of broad-based, institution-wide um, kind of dialogue that's happening around some of these issues, I think, is quite unprecedented. And we, of course, are thinking about those same issues, many of which are more domestically oriented from a global lens as well. So how, are, how do we construct our funding opportunities to ensure that LMIC investigators and institutions, including those in Africa, are not just participants or sending samples, but are actually helping to de develop and design at all stages of the research. Um, how are they featured as principal investigators on some of these studies rather than simply being collaborators? I think these are all um, things that we're thinking a great deal about. And I think we are actually making quite a lot of progress. There are new, and I think the moonshot and other efforts will continue to provide opportunities to realize some of these aspirations.